It was a simple little teeny tiny thing, but it came back. The signs and symptoms of a brain tumor to look out for. It felt really boring to me. The simple change that's turned using an inhaler into a breath of fresh air. And what researchers say is a bigger threat than war, terrorism, addiction, and disease. Welcome to Ion Health, where we focus on stories that affect your physical and mental well-being. I'm Michael George. For the first time, the CDC says bird flu has caused respiratory symptoms in an infected dairy worker. There's a renewed focus on a vaccine for the avian flu. Stephanie Stahl has an update on what's being called promising research. Scientists at the University of Pennsylvania working on a new bird flu vaccine. It mounts a very good, or elicits a very good immune response. Penn immunologist Scott Hensley led the study on mice and ferrets. He says with the bird flu now spreading from cows to dairy workers, it's showing signs of mutating. This virus is circulating very widely in birds and now in cows, and that scares me because cows are an animal that humans have a lot of contact with. What we fear is that the virus will start changing to replicate better in cows, and that some of those mutations that might occur during that process might facilitate better replication in humans. Could this turn into another COVID? Oh, I hope not. Uh, but I, you know, we never really know when a virus is gonna make that jump from other animals into humans. Currently, the CDC says the threat to humans is low, but there is high interest in the vaccine that in addition to people might also be used in poultry or dairy cows. This new vaccine is following the same pipeline that led to the quick development of the COVID vaccine. mRNA vaccines are uh, such an agile platform. As soon as we see a new virus, whether it's a coronavirus or in this case a flu virus, we can very quickly design new mRNA vaccines to be specifically matched to what's circulating. Currently, the virus is contained to workers exposed to infected cows. There's been no human to human transmission, but there is now the first case of a dairy worker with respiratory symptoms, which might make it easier to spread. Stephanie Stahl, CBS News, Philadelphia. Maryland's health department reported its first heat related death this year, a 59 year old man from Prince George's County. Arizona's Maricopa County has already seen at least four deaths, with dozens under investigation. Last year, excessive heat was linked to more than 2,300 deaths across the country, the highest in 45 years. 38% of the patients who came in with severe heat illness last summer unfortunately passed away. At Valleywise Health in Arizona, the number of patients with heat-related illnesses jumped from about 15 in 2021 to 54 last summer. During the hottest months between June 1st and August 30th, we're seeing an average age range in the early 40s, which is a lot younger than usual. The average body temperature of the patients we treated last summer was around 107 degrees Fahrenheit. This year, all Phoenix Fire Department emergency vehicles are equipped with cold water immersion therapy to treat patients before they get to the hospital. So that's our goal is to improve patient survivability, reduce or eliminate that underlying cause for their medical event and deliver them to the hospital in a better condition than when we found them. And don't forget about our furry friends. According to PETA, there were 163 heat-related animal deaths reported last year. Veterinarians say pets need extra attention. Careful uh, when they're outside and they're playing in the heat that they stay hydrated and they don't get overheated. Uh, you know, remember our dogs don't really, you know, they don't really think ahead per se. Uh, they're very good at living in the moment. Uh, which means that they can get overheated and they can they can wind up with heat stroke, which is which can be a very life threatening situation. PETA says there's been at least five animal heat related deaths so far this year. A new report says pollution is a greater global health threat than war, terrorism, addiction and disease. According to data from a coalition of researchers, pollution was responsible for 8.8 .8 million premature deaths between 2015 and 2022 and reduced worldwide life expectancy by 2.9 years. The authors say there's an immediate need to better monitor these pollutants and study how exposure to them raises cardiovascular risks. Well, the main driver of air pollution remains fossil fuels, the burning of fossil fuels. But you do have other sources of pollution, including other forms of combustion. And what happens is when you inhale this, it causes significant stress to your cardiovascular system, to your lungs, as well as other organs. 
and increases your risk for cardiovascular disease. It's now estimated that one in five deaths from cardiovascular disease are attributable to air pollution. CBS News medical contributor Dr. Celine Gounder says the most at-risk groups are the very young and very old, and lower income families that are more likely to live closer to highways and factories. Lead pollution is also a major problem, especially when it comes to our children. A new study found lead in two popular organic-based snacks. The CDC says kids under six are at the greatest risk to lead exposure, which can include damage to the brain and nervous system and slow development. Christine Lazar reports. Macarena Rizzo is very careful about the food she gives her 15-month-old daughter, Venus. These are staples that you give to her a lot. Yes. That's why she bought these veggie puffs from the company Lesser Evil. Something close to homemade. And I found that they have, or they supposedly have uh, good ingredients, uh, so that's why I picked them. But a new study from Consumer Reports discovered levels of lead in two snacks from Lesser Evil. One with 112% of the daily allowance, another had 60%, and an organic puff from the company Serenity Farms had 53% according to California's lead standard, which is the nation's strictest. Both the Serenity and Lesser Evil snacks are made with flour from cassava root. A lot of these foods, especially when you consider root vegetables like cassava, they often get contaminated with lead through pollution, through the water, um, and contaminated soil. So in a lot of cases, there's, it's unavoidable. Consumer Reports testing did find that two organic puff snacks from Once Upon a Farm made with sorghum flour instead of cassava have much less lead. In fact, one of them had the lowest reading we've had since we've tested these types of products since 2017. The company Lesser Evil tells CBS News food safety is a top priority and we conduct extensive testing for all Lesser Evil products that complies with California Prop 65 and federal standards. And Serenity Kids says our puffs are and have always been safe for consumption. All of our products test well below the maximum allowable dose levels. Consumer Reports recommends giving the cassava-based snacks they tested in limited servings, but Rizzo says she's no longer going to use them. Christine Lazar, CBS News, Los Angeles. The U.S. has the highest rate of women dying in pregnancy or childbirth among high-income nations. The Commonwealth Fund report found that there were 22 maternal deaths for every 100,000 live births in the U.S. in 2022. That rate was more than twice as much for black women. These numbers have declined since the pandemic. The report says the U.S. has one of the lowest supplies of midwives and OBGYNs and that a majority of the deaths are preventable. Norway was the only country that recorded zero maternal deaths. Prenatal care is free and universally accessible there. The report also found half of the countries have a rate of five deaths or fewer. For more on maternal health, we turn to an agonizing story about a miscarriage that nearly killed a woman. Omar Villafranca spoke exclusively with a Texas family about their experience navigating one of the country's strictest and most confusing abortion laws. Ryan Hamilton says his wife was nearly 13 weeks pregnant with their second child when she called to tell him she was having a miscarriage. She said that our baby has no heartbeat. Medical records reviewed by CBS News show his wife was seen at a SurePoint Emergency Center branch near their home in North Texas. We were told she could take a medication ugh, to finish what had already started at home. Hamilton's wife was prescribed misoprostol, a drug that induces labor and is used for both miscarriages and abortions. But after two days... It's not working, so she goes back in and that doctor says, due to the current stance, I cannot prescribe this medicine for you. So you just assume the stance of the state of Texas because of the law what are we going to do? Leave the baby inside her so she can get an infection, get sepsis, that can kill her. Hamilton immediately drove his wife to another hospital an hour away. He asked CBS News not to name the hospital. What do you think the delay is? I think the delay is their confusion on what they're allowed to do 
That's what it feels like. They feel scared. The doctors feel scared. According to Texas law, abortions are illegal once a fetal heartbeat is detected, with exceptions for medical emergencies. They said it was not enough of an emergency to perform a DNC. DNC stands for dilation and curatage, a surgical procedure to remove fetal tissue. It's used for both miscarriages and abortions. The law does not require there to be a medical emergency to perform a DNC if there is no cardiac activity. Doctors opted to give Hamilton's wife a higher dose of medication and sent her home. I go into the bathroom and she is on the bathroom floor. There's blood where she fell from the toilet to the floor. She's unconscious. Did you think at any point that you were going to lose your wife? Yes. Yeah. So what happens next? At that point, we're able to verify that the baby is no longer with her. Ugh. What do you want people to know about your experience? I want people to know that this really happens. Everything in her life right now that she's having to do to get better is not just a reminder of the baby that we lost. It's a reminder of what they put her through. SurePoint Emergency Center said it couldn't comment citing patient privacy laws. The other hospital told CBS News it follows federal and Texas law in accordance with national standards of care. Hamilton told me he does not plan to sue any of the hospitals, but hopes his story helps other families. Omar Villafranca, CBS News, New York. Coming up, a skin cancer treatment being used to fight other cancers. And what's driving women of color out of the medical field. Welcome back. New research shows more female doctors of color are leaving their jobs due to burnout. Dominic Garcia has details on what's causing the exodus. A recent study conducted by the nonprofit Physicians for a Healthy California reveals a growing number of minority women doctors are feeling burned out and are just leaving their field of work. Our survey found that it was almost one in two. It was about 47% of all women physicians of color reported experiencing burnout and really being concerned about their wellness. That's a significant increase from the same study conducted in 2018. Lupe Alonso Diaz is the president and CEO of Physicians for Healthy California and the co-author of a study called A Prescription for Change. She says female physicians of color are drowning in work feel undervalued, and in many cases, experiencing discrimination and racial bias. And aside from the burnout at work, many of them are juggling responsibilities at home. By the time that they got to work, they were already on their second shift, meaning that they're taking care of their children. They're also parenting their parents, so they truly are the sandwich generation. Alonzo Diaz says with a shortage of primary care doctors nationwide, there's an urgent need to retain female physicians of color because they're filling critical roles in our communities. That are much more likely to go and practice in those underserved communities where we have low income, under resourced communities, we have immigrant and refugees communities. So, what are some of the solutions to retaining more female physicians of color? So, the more that employers can create policies and practices that support all physicians, and particularly women physicians of color, the more that they'll be able to retain them. The study suggests other recommendations, like allowing anonymous employee feedback and compensating them for their work in equity, diversity, and inclusion roles. Dominic Garcia, CBS News, Sacramento. Around 90,000 people a year are diagnosed with a primary brain tumor, according to the American Brain Tumor Association. Christian Benavides brings us one woman's story of survival. Grandmother of five, Kathy Magstad, has beaten the odds twice. I had to make peace the, with the beast. Her journey with glioblastoma, a fast-growing, aggressive brain tumor, began in 2017. 
Her first symptom, uncontrollable twitching of her tongue. It was a simple little teeny tiny thing, but it came back and it came back. Her father died of the same brain cancer and was diagnosed at the same age, 63. My heart sunk. You know, you just, you can't help but think this is the way it's going to be. But Magstead's tumor was caught early. It was the size of two small raisins. Doctors at the University of Miami Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center performed an awake craniotomy. I don't want any invaders. Get them out. And they did. Dr. Macarena de la Fuente is chief of neuro-oncology at the center's New Brain Tumor Institute. Unfortunately, you know, the tumor came back five years after. So last year, she had a second surgery and took part in a clinical trial testing a mix of two chemotherapy drugs, one of only eight people in the world to participate. We check for uh, toxicities, whether the combination of drug is uh, safe. In her case, it was. Tests currently show her cancer is clear. The median survival for a glioblastoma is 18 months. We are here to provide hope. There is no cure for glioblastoma, but new treatments are helping patients live longer. So how are you feeling today? Hanging in. And Maxted yeah. is grateful for that. Cristian Benavides, CBS News. Miami. A recently approved treatment for melanoma is showing promise fighting other types of cancer. We look at how till therapy is doing what traditional chemotherapy cannot. John Kosick of Cincinnati is breathing a little more easily these days. They don't see any cancer in my scans, which is a plus, right? The 59-year-old was diagnosed with advanced lung cancer in 2020, despite not smoking for nearly three decades. Surgery and traditional chemotherapy didn't keep his disease at bay, so Kosick was recommended for clinical trials of TIL therapy at the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center. Everything looks stable. Dr. Kai Hu's work helped win FDA approval of TIL, or tumor infiltration lymphocyte therapy, to treat metastatic melanoma. Now, TIL is showing promise in advanced lung cancers like COSIX. We are trying to expand uh, horizon for this uh, treatment and hopefully bring the treatment to more uh, cancer patients to treat more cancers. TIL therapy works by extracting the body's immune-fighting T cells, growing them in a lab to number in the billions, and infusing them back into the patient. A one-time chemotherapy treatment clears out unhealthy T cells to make space for the new TIL T cells. March 6th marked two years since Kosick started the clinical trial, a process he says hasn't been easy, but he's grateful for the outcome. Yes, I'd go through that again for the result. Kosick is still working and spending time with his family and grandchildren, time he might not have had without this new treatment. After the break, how the Girl Scouts are battling loneliness and how this family found a colorful way to fight asthma. back. The Girl Scouts are tackling a serious mental health concern. The group conducted research revealing that the vast majority of girls, some as young as five, experience loneliness. Jared Hill reports. High school sophomore Jola Strayhorn knows firsthand the struggles teens faced coming out of the pandemic. We all had to get used to like speaking to each other, like in person and in social interactions. Girls were so isolated. They weren't in schools with each other. A new survey from Girl Scouts of the USA shows 70% of girls as young as five experience feelings of loneliness. And to know that it grows as they get older and that also it really impacts their self-confidence. The survey shows as loneliness increases, confidence drops. But friendship and meaningful connections can empower girls and build resilience. The National Alliance on Mental Illness collaborated with the Girl Scouts on this research. Kids living in today's society are constantly being inundated with messages and their ability to 
step away from all of the information that they're receiving, it's quite challenging. Experts say adults should keep an eye out for changes in their child's behavior, sleeping and eating habits, and have open conversations as a family. If we ignore these behavioral changes, then kids won't be able to get the tools, strategies, and resources that they need in order to cope with some of these challenges. Girl Scouts of the USA offers a variety of mental wellness programs to support girls. For Jola, she says confidence starts with yourself. Pump yourself up and to give you more confidence so you're able to know that you're like just as good as anybody else. Being a Girl Scout helps girls form lasting friendships, which the organization says is more important now than ever. Jared Hill, CBS News, New York. A new book has some parents rethinking their approach to raising kids in this digital age. It's called The Anxious Generation, how the great rewiring of childhood is causing an epidemic of mental illness. Author Jonathan Haidt argues we're overprotecting children in the real world while underprotecting them online, and that's leading to mental health challenges. All over the developed world, family life is the same. It's constant arguments over screen time. Like, we didn't ask for this. How is it that we're all spending so much time in this struggle? He points to a dramatic difference in the upgrade from flip phones to smartphones. In 2015, everyone's got a smartphone, front-facing camera, Instagram. Lots of companies are competing for their attention. What happens? Time with friends plummets. Kids don't go over to each other's homes anymore. In between classes, it's quiet because everyone's on their phone. And this is exactly when mental health uh, levels of depression and anxiety double. Suicide is up by 50%. Loneliness. The kids are so lonely yeah. because they're doing this all the time. They're not connecting with people. Hyde says solutions work best when parents act together. He suggests no smartphones before high school, no social media until age 16, phone-free schools, and more free play and independence in the real world. Many lawmakers and schools are considering limiting the use of phones. An asthma attack can be one of the scariest moments for a parent as their child struggles for air. The CDC says roughly 10 people in the U.S. die every day from an asthma attack. Ian Lee reports on one man who's helping kids breathe easier. Martha loves to play, especially ping pong with her dad. But a severe asthma attack nearly killed the six-year-old from England. It was a massive shock. It was a bit like an out-of-body kind of experience. She was in a coma for a week, uh, and then she stayed a, a good week after that as well. Martha recovered, and now her daily routine starts with five big breaths. Martha uses her inhaler twice a day, but initially refused to use it until a family friend, Will Hogg, gave it a funky makeover. I was only going to make one, but I saw that one in five children have asthma, um, and I thought, okay, there's such an opportunity to help more people. When I had the old one, I didn't really want to take it, so it felt really boring to me. Martha's duck and unicorn inhalers were an instant hit just seeing her immediately so much prouder of her inhaler and running around saying that it was her unicorn puff puff. Will and his wife now make handmade inhalers full time, producing more than 20,000 with fun patterns like dinosaurs, ducks and soccer balls. We see around about four people a day dying of asthma in the UK and we have one of the highest death rates because of asthma. The UK's National Health Service took notice and is looking to see if the designs could improve inhaler use with more young people. So far we've seen really, really good positive feedback on the inhaler covers from families. All inhalers are now cool in this house. They are all customized. They're definitely hers now. With the new inhaler, everyone can now breathe a sigh of relief and focus on other things, like who serves next. Ian Lee, CBS News, London. That's this week's Eye on Health. I'm Michael George. Thanks for joining us, and be well.